So now we, we did have a question about family engagement. Um, that's the second pillar in IEL's work. Uh, what's the public's role, including the role of families in public education? And uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Quasi Rollins, who's a member of the leadership team here at the Institute, uh, will be moderating that panel. So Quasi, if you and your colleagues, uh, G2 and Sue and Yoli could come up, we'll move this along. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Quasi Rollins, the Director of Leadership Programs at the Institute for Educational Leadership, and really happy to be leading a conversation around a, a critical issue. The, the, the opening question for this panel, state, district, and school leaders struggle with how to cultivate and sustain positive relationships with families that can improve outcomes. Are we making progress? And actually, the quick answer is it depends on who you talk to. In some ways, we are. Um, uh, over the years, we've gotten much better at this. We've learned a lot. There's no shortage of strategies, everything from home visitation to academic parent-teacher teams in terms of intensity. There's no shortage of frameworks. You know, one of the older frameworks uh, kind of launched by Joyce Epstein was the six types of involvement, six types of parent involvement. That was probably, what, 25, 25, 30 years ago. So we've got lots of frameworks, and even this spring, um, the U.S. Department of Education released a, its framework, the dual capacity building framework for family school partnerships. And they laid it out very nicely in, in that document. Over 50 years of research links the various roles that families play in a child's education as supporters of learning, encouragers of grit and determination, as models of lifelong learning, and advocates of proper programming and placements for their child. You know, kind of at IEL and, and among many of our partners, our working definition of family engagement is really one that was kind of launched officially by the National Working Group on Family School and Community Engagement. And that is that family engagement is a shared responsibility in which schools and other community agencies and organizations are committed to engaging families in meaningful and culturally respective ways, and families are committed to actively supporting their children's learning and development. Family engagement should be continuous across a child's life, spanning from cradle to career and beyond, certainly spanning from early Head Start programs to college prep. And family engagement should be carried out everywhere that children learn, at home, in pre-K programs, preschool programs, in schools, in after-school programs, in faith-based institutions, and other community programs and activities. That definition recognizes that family engagement needs to focus on activities that are linked to children's learning at home, at school, and in the community. So as we explore this question, I want to just kind of briefly introduce our three speakers, and then they're going to take five to seven minutes to kind of lay out their perspective on this issue, and then we're gonna have a dialogue, a conversation. Our first speaker is Yoli Flores. She's got over 25 years of leadership experience in program policy and advocacy work on behalf of the needs of children and families from cradle to career and beyond. Yoli has worked in the nonprofit sector and city government and philanthropy. She's a past member of the Board of Education of the Los Angeles Unified School District and she's currently a senior fellow with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Sue Swenson is the Deputy Assistant Secretary, U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. She's active in the Minneapolis schools as well as in state and federal policy before being named a Joseph P. Kennedy Fellow in the U.S. Senate in 1996. She previously served as CEO of the ARC, United States, as executive director of the Kennedy Foundation, and also as a U.S. Commissioner for Developmental Disabilities in the Clinton administration. And lastly, G2 Brown of Chicago, a former community schools coordinator, former education organizer with the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization in Chicago, and now the national director of Journey for Justice, an alliance of grassroots community, youth, and parent-led organizations in 36 cities, is that the right number now? 
Uh, that's that's hopeful. That's so hopeful. Not quite more 30. Like 20, more like 23. 23 cities around the country. I'm thinking in the future. Yes, sir. <laughs> Pushing back and demanding community-driven alternatives to the privatization and dismantling of public school systems. So first, we're going to hear from Yoli. Great. Good morning. Um, before I start, I really wanted to um, commend the first panel. Um, I found it quite refreshing uh, that I would come to a panel in Washington, D.C. that from the get-go puts race on the table, um, unapologetically and very courageously. So um, it gave me, I think, a little bit more uh, confidence that I could follow suit. Um, which I would do anyway. Um, <clears throat> but it's, uh, it's always helpful to have um, some company in the room. So thank you to the panel for that. Um, and actually my remarks um, are really related to that because when we ask the question, are we making progress? The answer is, it depends. And uh, it begs the question for who? Um, so I'll, I'll start with giving you sort of the good news, and it's, uh, it's the progress that I think we are making and that um, helps me breathe with a normal heartbeat when I think about this kind of progress. So I think over the last uh, decade or so, we've seen the emergence of some very exciting work across the nation in cities and states and uh, even here in Washington DC. We've seen the emergence of great new curricula and models. Um, the people that I have the opportunity to work with now um, in my role at the Campaign for Grade Level Reading where my focus is on the role of parents um, has led me to know of work like the Parent Leadership Training Institute out of Connecticut, um, the work in uh, California with the Parent Institute for Quality Education, the work around the country with parent voices and parent ambassadors, Abriendo Puertas and Kofi in Chicago, um, that range from leadership development to organizing of parents uh, to real skill building to really understand how to navigate school systems and systems in general for children and their families. And we even are seeing, well, we have seen this actually, um, I think we started with some intentionality around parents with Head Start. So we're building on that and I think the, the momentum is growing. We see school districts today, including my own in Los Angeles, that um, have put in place great technology. We have parent portals. We have uh, texting uh, to give parents information. Um, there's much more technology in play to try to engage and inform and keep parents um, in the know. In some places, we're seeing great efforts to train teachers and school staff support of how to better work with and involve and engage parents. Um, in some states, we see parent engagement actually become a more systematic and intentional, and I use intentional actually very softly, um, um, of uh, engaging parents. So um, again, one of my favorite leading states is Connecticut for the work that they're doing, um, having ushered the Parent Trust Act, where there's almost a billion dollars available to really bring parents to the work of community and for them to actually lead. <clears throat> we see progress in philanthropy. Um, recently, Kellogg um, and their family engagement, parent leadership and family engagement RFP process drew over 1,100 grantees, the largest ever um, on any initiative. And at the federal level, Kwesi, you mentioned the new framework. Um, We've seen uh, Secretary Duncan push for doubling the amount of Title I dollars for parent engagement. Uh, we've seen um, evidence uh, that the feds really meant business when in Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant, 
there was uh, extensive language on family engagement. So I think there is progress. Um, but I get cranky and my heartbeat increases dramatically when I really look at what is actually happening on the ground. And what is actually happening on the ground, especially for poor parents and parents of color, is frankly pathetic. Um, we see parents uh, very disconnected from their school systems. We see that parents actually hear a lot of talk about parent engagement and parent involvement. But we don't see a real walking of the talk. We see, uh, we, we see very few indica indications that, sc that schools are actually reaching um, some of the most disconnected parents. And I'll tell you a little story in, in the last minute of my opening um, about uh, an, a recent uh, set of events in Los Angeles to, to make the point. We also see that schools are still focusing more on engaging families in school participating in school site councils, perhaps, or, or encouraging them to be part of PTA. But we don't see them really extending themselves to encourage and engage families in the support and the education of their children at home, and what that means, and equipping them with the skills and knowledge and supports that they need. Families and teachers still, by and large, report each other as the problem. I experience this day in and day out as a school board member. I'm still recovering, by the way. <laughs> um, and we continue to see a gap between what teachers want children to know when they arrive at school and what parents think children should know and be able to do. That gap is still enormous. And at every school site, I see way too few dollars dedicated to parent engagement. Um, even when you have, um, as a floor, your 1% of Title I, hopefully at some point it will be 2%, um, most school, district, school districts, at least in California, will barely reach that amount. And I'll, um, my, and my other uh, huge concern um, is that, by the way, this is not on schools alone. Employers and business, speaking of, of really crossing across, cutting across boundaries um, and helping us be leaders across systems for children and families, um, employers are no help, especially for families and low-income jobs. I don't know how many of you read the Starbucks story in the New York Times um, about a mom, a single parent with her child who never knew what time she was going to be called in, what her schedule would be the next day. How can a parent structure their life of their child, make sure they're in school where they need to get to school or early education programs, when they have no idea day by day what their work life or work day will be like? So it's on all of us, really, to figure out how to really honor the role of parents and the education of their children. Am I out of time? Yes. Because I, I, okay, I will come back and tell you the LA story because it just makes the point so no, tell well. The, tell the LA story. Okay. Um, so uh, this, this um, incident actually this winter, um, winter of 2014, so earlier this year, um, led by United Way, um, really wanted to get a sense of how, what much, how much progress uh, was LA Unified making. I had ushered a resolution while I was a school board member called Parents as Equal Partners in the Education of Their Children. It was groundbreaking. It was going to change the culture and the behavior and the commitment of our school district for how it really in, um, engaged and shared power with parents. So it was a lofty idea, 7-0 on the board, commitment by the superintendent. So fast forward four years. It's been four years since I left the board. It was the last thing I ushered through. It was the first and the last. Um, my colleagues at United Way led an effort to have uh, parents actually go 
and visit schools. And they were going to visit schools and ask to see the school report card, which has now been in place for almost six years in Los Angeles. They were to ask for a tour of the school. They were to ask for information about the, the school's curriculum um, and ask if they could come back and uh, bring their spouse or a family member to also visit the school. 68 schools were visited throughout the district. And here was the result. And uh, when I talk about low-income families, I'm really talking about black and brown families in LA. So parents from low-income families were less likely to get a copy of the school report card. At their school, staff actually had no idea what the, that was. Some parents had to point out, oh, it's that document there on your counter. Um, yet our families in our more affluent areas were immediately given a copy of the scorecard and shared what the results were, what other information the parent needed. Parents that visited um, in low-income communities of LA Unified um, were more likely to be asked uh, to provide ID and address verification, verification before any answers could be, any questions could be answered. Across the district, actually this, this is across all, um, all families that participated, school staff were not able to answer the question about their school curriculum. But all of them asked, could I follow up then if there isn't anyone now to answer my question? Um, only in higher income communities were parents followed up with. Um, not one parent from any of the low income schools um, had anyone follow up with them. And then when they asked for the school tours, majority of black and Latino families were uh, told that tours were not available. And, uh, and if they did want a tour, they needed to come back with their ID and with a home address. Mm -hmm. So LA Unified has now the best technology. I love their parent portal. I love they've got Abriendo Puertas throughout every, almost every elementary school. Abriendo Puertas is a parent leadership program for Latino immigrant parents. It is making progress. When I, what I, when I see what is actually happening every day in the relational um, aspect of what it means to engage parents as authentic partners in the education of their children. We have a long way to go in Los Angeles. My sense is we have a long way to go across the nation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So when I was in Minneapolis, uh, I had three sons, two of whom were always being recruited to the gifted programs, and one of whom in the middle never walked or talked. And my advocacy was about special education, which I learned was an equal opportunity uh, minority group. So the special education advisory councils include people who are wealthy, people who live in poverty, people from all ethnic and racial backgrounds, immigrants. The point was to try to recruit as many of these people as possible. I just want you to know that the people at my son's school called me the nice lady from hell. <laughs> because I was always, is this on? I'm yes. sorry. I'm getting a signal that it's not, so. It's a little hard to hear, so okay. Right I will. I'm a little tall for the mic. <laughs> so, oh, I will pull it out. Because, nice lady from hell, because I was never mean, I never sued them. I told them at the beginning of every meeting, I will never sue you under this law. Um, which was seen as a giving up of power. But I also never went away. And I never stopped asking for what I thought my son and other children, both with and without disabilities, needed in the school. What I learned very early was that uh, my rights to an IEP and my rights to write an individualized education plan for my son were not good enough. That if I wanted inclusive experiences for him, which is what best practice shows is the only thing that works, 
I needed to make sure that the school was inclusive of the needs of all of the children in the school. And that meant um, a very different kind of work than what IDEA puts out in front of us. So here I am now in the federal agency that oversees IDEA. I worked in the Senate on a reauthorization of the law. And I sometimes worry that the law is letting us sink in compliance. I want to really underline that I think it's progress for us to learn this. In 1975, when the law was written, we thought if you give parents individual rights and due process rights and they have to sign a contract before their child can come to school, it will be better for them. But what I've learned is your child with a disability is the only child who requires a contract to attend the school. And not only is it an individualized education program for your child, but there's a placement committee. There are no other programs in, in education where a team of teachers decides whether the child shall be allowed into the school or not. And in Minneapolis, what I learned is my African American and Native American friends didn't want their children to be assessed for special education because the risk of segregation came with it. This is a serious problem. And we are only now getting to the point with the civil rights data collection to be able to overlap and look at these data and understand what happens to children of color who are in special education and how is that different from majority children or wealthy children. It's a really serious problem. So a couple of things. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America said that the future of the democracy depends on the education of mothers because it's mothers who will educate children and tell them to question authority. Going back to Jerry Weiss's point about you have to encourage people and give them enough information so they can kick your butt. This is something that is um, in a compliance system terribly undervalued and underrated. It's very difficult to come up against a school district that spends more money on lawyers than it does on special education. And there are some. And they are, those lawyers are there to keep you out. So you need to go in in a different way and have a different kind of partnership with the schools. Um, I tried to do that. I tried to do it based on my knowledge that trust. Uh, anybody know who Vince Cavello is? Anybody know who Oprah Winfrey is? <laughs> Vince Cavello was a journalist at uh, Columbia University who trained Oprah Winfrey in how to speak about issues and how to talk to people about issues. And he has a simple calculus, which is trust equals caring plus credibility. And I tried to always go into everything I did, because I learned that when I worked in the environmental field. I tried to go in and really figure out, what does the teacher need? What, ca what caring can I provide? Or what information can I provide? Or which one is missing here that would allow her or him to make a decision to really get involved in educating my child beyond the level of compliance that's offered by the law? So if you go out for lunch today, you go into a lovely restaurant, and you order your lunch, and the waiter comes to your table, and you say, he says, what would you like for lunch, madam? We have wonderful specials today. You say, I don't care what you bring me. It just better not have any bugs in it. <laughs> That's compliance level advocacy. I cannot tell you how many times I have trained parents to say, no, don't go in and demand compliance with IDEA. Your goal is to go in and demand, what, are, what is the teacher going to do beyond compliance? I noticed with my children, when they were talking about Will or Eric, the school said, oh, you're going to be so loved. You're just going to love what we're doing. We have this whole language program or that this. We're doing IB, and it's really interesting. And we have lots of AP courses. And with Charlie, they never said it, but the underlying message was, what is the least we can do without being sued? This is a profound problem when you're trying to engage parents 
in a trusting and caring, incredible way in your schools. If they see that on the face of the person, it doesn't matter what their race is, it doesn't matter what their economic background is, they can all see that on the face of the IEP team. Okay, how can I keep your kid as low as possible? This is one of the reasons why we have many school districts in the United States where 15% of the students with IEPs are able to read at a fourth grade level. 15% of the students with IEPs. And 12% of students in school have IEPs. So we're talking about a lot of kids with very, very poor outcomes. Why am I talking about this when I'm supposed to be talking about progress? Because we know it now. And we didn't used to know it, and that's progress. Getting to the point where we have report cards and we have answers and we can begin to say, here's what's wrong with the way we've been doing things, and here are some of the things we need to do differently. I'm really glad um, Yoli mentioned our framework. I will not go into it. I encourage you to look it up online. It's uh, brilliant and uh, profound. Under IDEA, we fund a new project called SWIFT Schools, which you will find, I think, at swiftschools.org. It is designed to encourage schools to build trusting relationships with parents uh, around issues of special education and English as a second language and Title I and really braid those together. We have parents in schools who are, you can't sign away your IEP rights because those are constitutional rights but you can give up the IEP process. And we have parents in the SWIFT schools that are stepping back and saying, you know what, I'm getting so much information and I have so much trust that I, I feel free to uh, set down some of this legal, um, the big sword that I go in with, which is what I used to do when I went in all the time. I just say, I'm not gonna sue you under this law. I also want to point you, because it's IEL, you've got to know the IEL guideposts, the transition guideposts. You've got to look at their work on families and engagement and how do we make sure that families have the support that they need. I, I want to tell you a story, and um, it's really important, so if I have a minute. Thomas Jefferson had a sister who was two years younger than he was. Her name was Elizabeth. He was very close to her. He was very close to her the to whole time she grew up. When their mother died, he became responsible for caring for her at Monticello, and therefore refused to be engaged in political activity for many years while he was caring for her. Refused to run for office before, before the nation was a nation, before, refused to get involved, and he wrote in his diary, I can't, I'm responsible for Elizabeth. Elizabeth, in today's terms, would probably be called severely autistic. In those terms, she was called an imbecile. She, didn't, she spoke a few words, and she took a few steps, but she wasn't responsible to care for herself. This is Thomas Jefferson, guys. So she died in 1774. There was uh, an earthquake at Monticello, followed by a hurricane. She ran out into the storm and drowned in a local stream. And he, at that time, was able to step up and be engaged in public life. I'm telling you the story because a lot of parents of children with disabilities, engagement is something they can't do unless you will support them to care for their children, to bring their children to the meeting, to have uh, child care at the meeting, to serve supper at the meeting. Five minutes of extra time to think about stuff just isn't on their schedule. Um, we owe these words, I believe, to a woman with disabilities. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That sentence was not written in some kind of puffy, idealistic way. It was written by a man who understood that people come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. I think we're still in American schools, not in a place with students with disabilities where we recognize that. We think that their rights to be educated can be circumscribed by this little law, what we call IDEA. And we don't understand that the real right to be educated 
comes from the heart and soul of the teacher and the leader who is willing to work beyond compliance. If you're not working beyond compliance, you're just a manager. <laughs> you have to reach out beyond and say, what is it we can do for these students with disabilities so they can grow up, be employed, so their parents understand that right from the get-go. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm grappling with the question. Uh, I don't want to be negative, but I think it's important. Um, maybe the best way I can share it is like this. Um, when I was a little boy, um, I was a, a, a rabid Bears fan. Uh, me and my father would watch Walter Payton, and uh, I just fell in love with football, and I knew that I would play for the Bears one day. So. <laughs> Uh, played football in high school and college and was pretty good and, 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 and felt like I was going to play in the NFL and then went to an NFL camp and realized that that dream was going to die in that camp and that was, <laughs> that was going to be it. But um, what came from that was um, I, went, I was in the music industry for a while and uh, moderately successful and uh, the record label had me go to a school in Chicago called Shakespeare, this is 1991. And uh, I go into school in Shakespeare, and it's, it's, this school is on the south side of Chicago. Um, I'm in a room full of young guys, you know, they, they laid back in the chair like, who was this guy? And we talked about the music industry, had a wonderful session. Uh, then one of them looked at me and said, you're not coming back though, are you? And it hit me, this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, I, I was, uh, I had, I wanted to become a radio DJ, and I, but I realized that working with young people was what I was supposed to do. So um, it's really weird. I, I just dropped everything and I began volunteering at a local community organization and learned how to do, um, learned from a very skilled man how to do, how to work with schools in the community and how to do leadership development programs with young people because there was a need for our young people to be inspired. I lived in a neighborhood where we didn't own anything in it. You go to the corner store, it's owned by somebody else. You go to the gas station, it's owned by somebody else. And the community I come from is called uh, Bronzeville. Bronzeville is where Daniel, uh, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, the first man to perform successful surgery on the human heart, set up his hospital, Providence Hospital. It's where uh, uh, Dr. Margaret Burroughs started the DuSable Museum of Black History. It's also where uh, Sam Cooke grew up, and Minnie Riverton grew up, and Ida B. Wells, a civil rights crusader, lived. It's where Reverend Jesse Jackson set up Rainbow Push Coalition. It's where the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, the oldest African-American-led grassroots organizing group in the city is at. This neighborhood where the first mayor of uh, Chicago, Dr. Harold Washington, went to high school, where Eddie Harris and, and Nat, King, Nat King Cole and Dinah Washington went to high school. It's a historic community, if you all get my point. And, but now in 1991, we didn't own anything in it. And I felt like the schools was a way to begin to engage young people to teach them that they can be masters of their own community, not just customers. Um, and because our schools were in pretty bad shape, I was with a, it was a, a group of us, and they loved to see some young African-American men that were positive, that were coming into the school. So the, sc the school opened its doors, and we did some incredible work. Um, we took young people to the Passamaquoddy Native American Reservation in Maine. Um, we took them to the United Nations to talk about what were some of the real issues impacting young people. And these young people, they, they, they weren't just going to be on the bus. They were, they were active participants. Then things began to change. Uh, Paul Vallis became the CEO of Chicago Public Schools and they ushered in school probation. And you start seeing the schools a lot less willing to have people in the community at the school. Uh, from 9 to 11.30 was reading block. And then, you know, the, the curriculum was narrowed, so the teachers didn't have the space to really teach. A lot of teachers had to use direct instruction, and so they weren't able to really, you know, utilize the art in which they, they were trained. Um, and so then you began to hear about schools getting ready to close. And the district is even less willing to have community people in the school. Um, now, 
uh, the school that I, I, I sat on a local school council at since 2003, because we opposed the closing of that school. If I go to the school, Chicago Public Schools Safety and Security surrounds me. And this is the same school where I, I, I got a grant for 75000 to improve the library of. We mentored students. Um, I, can, I can go on. So I think that we've actually regressed in regards to districts engaging young people and systems being uh, engaging people in the community and parents and being open to community wisdom. Because what I learned was that it's community wisdom and academic expertise that go together to help make school improvement. Um, there are people in our community that have relationships with our students that our teachers would never have. They have credibility with our students that our teachers would never have. And um, I've just seen a lot over the past 10, 15 years that have taught me that we have a long way to go because there's a perception of uh, people in our communities, whether you're in Detroit, whether you're in Baltimore, whether you're in Los Angeles. Uh, Yoli was talking about Los Angeles and one of the most brilliant men I've, I've ever met in my life was Alberto Retana from, from um, the Community Coalition in Los Angeles or Inner City Struggle or in Chicago, Logan Square Neighborhood Association. They created community schools, right? Uh, these Latina women on the north side of Chicago. Um, Make the Road New York started the Student Success Program in Brooklyn, a student-led program which increased the graduation rate by 67%, three straight years at this school, and then the district defunded it. Um, so I think we, are, we have moved forward in regards to our capacity and our communities to not just be mentors, to actually bring a level of expertise into our schools to help inspire our young people. Um, but I think that the districts, because in many urban districts, we even rural ones too, because if you look at Kill Michael, Mississippi, or you look at Eupora, Mississippi, they're closing entire African-American school districts. They're shutting down school districts and moving young people past the, the white district that's right next to them and to the adjacent. African American school district 25 miles away from their homes. That's not progress to me. It's not progress when uh, folks in New Orleans after enduring one of the worst uh, natural disasters in our history, their voices aren't listened to and, and basically their city is used as a gold rush for privatization. That shouldn't be okay with any of us. And that's not an anti-charter school statement. I think that charter schools under the original intent of charter schools are needed. Like there's a charter school operator in Chicago, um, uh, Urban Prep. Now, Urban Prep does some wonderful things in preparing and making sure that young people get into college. Now, they have other issues, like you know, only 41% of their freshmen graduate. That's a problem. You know, that's a problem. And what that happens is many people that view education for profit develop really creative systems of selecting our young people and kicking our young people out and then presenting it as, you know, progress. Well, uh, folks in our community are a little sharper than that. So I think in Chicago, you close 50 schools and then you see violence explode. And nobody's, one, nobody's put two and two together to say if Johnny's 16 years old and he's sitting on a bus stop in a community that's not his, his life is in danger. These, these are not small things. These are not like just anecdotes. These are realities in Los Angeles, in Oakland, in, in, in Detroit, uh, in New Orleans, in Philadelphia, uh, in Camden, New Jersey. And I think what's problematic with that is that when you don't engage the people directly impacted, what you basically have are invader institutions in your communities. When schools are supposed to be community institutions, they're supposed to be institutions that help stabilize neighborhoods. So in the African-American community, historically, everybody knows it's always been the church. Well, it's not the church anymore. I mean, if you go drive down a block, you drive down a four block radius in any black community in the United States, you'd obviously see 15 to 16 churches. So the, the, the role that churches used to have in our community is no longer as sacred. I'm just telling you that from the ground. But schools are. And so I think that um, there's some, you know, and there are a lot of folks who are very lettered and, 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 
they're the director of talent for this and the director of talent for that, but they're missing some key elements of real leadership. One thing I learned in the community, I come from, a, I'm with the Journey for Justice Alliance, but I come from a grassroots organization um, that has always been about community organizing. We got about 800 members, um, but a lot of our members are generational. They were in our day camp when they were four, they're 26 years old, they have two children, their children are now in our day camp. So our relationship is not based on the issue, our relationship is based on love. So we fought the privatization of schools in our community with a level of fury that's been important, it's been critical. Um, and that there's some things that I think are missing in the, the corporate education agenda or in the way the districts are moving, I just wanna mention them very quickly. Um, four key components to leadership that I was taught is one, the ability to, to listen. That means not just endure, like we have to, that folks may have to do on some school boards sometimes, but really to listen, to respect the voice and the wisdom of the people that, that, that you're dealing with. Some of the wisest people I, I met, one of the strongest women that I ever worked with name was Linda Brown. She died in 2006. Linda Brown was a parent coordinator at Fuller Elementary School. This woman was so dedicated that she had a heart attack right there on the first floor um, of the school. And three days later was back at the school. I'm not making this up. And um, her response to me, whenever I would call her and say, you know, Ms. Brown, we got this meeting, blah, 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 you know how that goes. And her thing was, anything for the kids. And she lived it. And so her courage and her consistency and her sense of, um, her sense of, of really being honest about her love for children inspired me. And it made me a better organizer. It made me more accountable. So I think the ability to listen, and I think that's missing in, in what we see through uh, what's happening in many urban school districts today. Also, the, the, the ability to, to believe. You know, I've worked with children uh, in some of the poorest communities, you know, in the United States, and you're looking at a child with a uniform shirt that's dirty, but they look you in your eye, and you have to see beyond that in them. You have to be at a look. I remember one a young lady named Shanika Moore, fourth grade student at Fuller School, and I gave her a challenge to learn uh, Maya Angelou's Phenomenal Woman. And I didn't think she was going to do it. I went to see her the following Wednesday, and I'm leaving, and somebody's tugging on my pants leg. And it's Shanika. And Shanika, I turn around. Shanika's about 28 now, I'll let you know how old I am. But Shanika turns me around, and she goes into it. And she doesn't only do it, she does it with passion. She has voice elevation. I mean, she, I mean she's like rocking this thing. And she became a poet. She became a poet. She wrote own, a book of poetry when she was in college. But, but to see our young people and see beyond the conditions that they're in, the conditions are not their fault. Our children inherit conditions. They don't create them. And so I think to be able to really believe in, our, in the people in our communities is another thing. And then to collaborate. Often when we talk about parent engagement, we're talking about parent buy-in. We're not talking about really engaging people in the dream, but buy into my dream. And people in our communities know that. They know, and that's when you don't have sustained engagement. I just want to mention again, I'm very proud to come from an organization where we have sustained involvement from our members. And we do that because we genuinely respect each other. And one thing my mother taught me a long time, she said, never get a big head because you one check away. And that was just an old school lesson that I internalized. That, you know, that, that, you know whatever my title is means nothing. What, what really means something is am I sincere? Am I sincere? Can people trust me? Will I be strong in the face of changing circumstances? And I think that those are important qualities. And the last one is act. The Journey for Justice Alliance, we have pressured the U.S. Department of Education around coming up with another option for struggling schools besides closing them, charter expansion, turn around, and charter restart. People thought we were crazy. They were like, there's no way you're going to be able to impact that policy. But my thing is this, our only limitations are the ones we accept. And if we want to make change, people that make change are a little crazy. Because <laughs> you have to be crazy enough to believe you can do it. And so I sit before you all today, you know, just as a regular guy, but I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a community organizer. And part of being a community organizer, just like being a teacher, you have to be able to look into the eyes of your students and dream, and then inspire them to dream. So 
Um, I think there's capacity on the ground that can really help the process of, of engaging parents and bringing more expertise to the table. But I think we're moving backwards in regards to policy. I'm asking folks, uh, you can look at a report that we did called Death by a Thousand Cuts um, on our website, www.j4jalliance.com. Free downloads, so never say we didn't give you anything. And, um, but read that report. And we, we interviewed people from as far as Puerto Rico to Boston, Massachusetts, to talk about what, have, what has been the impact of the policies that have swept through your communities. And unanimously, people said they didn't listen to me. They told me what was best for my child instead of asking me what was best for my child. And so I think that, um, that we can do a lot better. We can do a lot better. That's it. And I'm sure there's lots of questions, comments. Try to keep them brief. We don't have a whole lot of time left. And be gentle, because the bears got blown out this week. <laughs> I'm still mourning. I'm still, still be mourning. gentle. Questions? What are, the, what are the dynamics that are allowing Mississippi to do what you were describing in terms of black districts being consolidated rather than black and white? I, we don't hear, I haven't heard anything about it on news, haven't yes, read sir. about it. Is this a big secret? I, I mean, I don't know if it's a secret. I would just say that um, you have a school board that is not really listening to the voices of the people directly impacted, and you have state legislature that is pushing the expansion of charters. And I think that, um, and so to do that, um, they want to clear up space, and so they've closed this entire school district and moved, you know, young people to uh, an adjacent district. But it's really no different than Chicago. The mechanism in Chicago is an appointed school board made up of, and, and it's not made up of, None of the people sitting on the school board have to live with the policies that they help to set, right? We have to clean up that mess in our neighborhoods. So I think it's all connected to an agenda that devalues the voice of working in low-income families, and most, in most cases, families of, uh, of communities of color. You know, there's a uh, last thing I'll just say. In Chicago, there was a school, there's a school called Lincoln, uh, they made up of some very progressive parents on the north side of Chicago, mainly a white school. Uh, the district tried to give them $20 million. You know those parents said, we don't want it. Give it to a South Side school. And they refused. To, they forced those parents to take their $20 million investment. So I think another issue that we have is our views on race infect many of the institutions that are supposed to be delivering services to our communities. So there's a, 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 a devaluing of children from particular communities. And so that's why you do these things. And if they don't work, that's OK. We're going to continue to experiment. Question in the back. Edwin Horsley, NEA Priority Schools. Question for Ms. Flores. One of our members is a man named Jose Laura. And he works in your, well, he works in the LA School District. And he's currently part of a group that's trying to get the school district to expand ethnic studies. My question is, how does that, in your mind, connect to why is that so important in connecting that to the community, to the family engagement issue? Well, it's both an issue about family engagement, but it's also an issue of honoring and respecting your students for who they are, where they come from, the language they speak, the traditions. It, you know, we, we forget that education is not just about the three R's. Education is about who you become. And who you become has to be grounded in your own history. And I think when we cut that off, and you know, we see that in Arizona in particular, um, you're, you're really making a statement about the society that you want and the society that you don't want. Another question? Anne? Anne Henderson, Annenberg Institute for School Reform. Of course, everything you guys said was music to my ears. Um, and I'm, and in the previous panel and this one, I'm hearing a couple of themes, one of which is the huge importance of developing leadership. 
not just school leaders. We can't just think if we have good school leaders and good superintendents and good school board members, that's going to take care of it. We have to invest in parent and community leadership. We have to give all the people in our community that feeling, as you were saying, you too, about ownership of their schools and ownership of what happens to their children, whatever their vulnerabilities are and whatever their backgrounds are. And I think that we are kind of coming to a moment where we could come together and agree on what some policies and investments must be to have that happen. And I'd love to hear from all of you on the panel about what you think the most important investments in parent and community leadership need to be. Because right now, as Jerry Wiest was saying in another context, we're doing a lot of random acts, and it's not coming together. So in the disabilities world, there's a program called Partners in Policymaking that you might want to look at. It's been in place for mm, 20 years plus. Uh, it's out of the Minnesota Governor's De uh, Developmental Disabilities Council. Every state has one of those councils, and every Department of Education is supposed to be sitting on those councils. Partners is a nine-month, very intensive program to teach parents of children with developmental disabilities and young people with developmental disabilities together in a leadership curriculum that teaches them, A, what is really best practice, which so often we're not told the truth about. B, how do I do the individual advocacy that I need to be able to do to get best practice for myself or my child? And C, how do I do systems advocacy to really move the needle for everybody? It's, a, it's an interesting model. It's a heavy investment. But um, I do think it's worth looking at. It is. Uh, it, usually a state will have 30 trainees each year. One key reason to train parents together with young people is to help parents understand that the real goal is to get their child to the point where they stand on their own two feet. And um, that's a really important message, I think, in many parent leadership programs, but particularly in disabilities, where parents tend to think sometimes that their uh, duty is to find a therapeutic program that will make the disability go away, rather than finding a way to facilitate the function of the child. If I could just mention, I think that um, it's very hard to develop uh, genuine parent and community leadership in an environment that benefits if parents are not engaged. So um, the corporate education movement um, lists as one of its prerequisite appointed school boards. When you look at the schools that replace public schools, they don't have active parent boards. They have governing boards with mainly business people on it and a couple of parents. I think that, one, educators should be the leaders of an education system and not business people. I think that's critical. I think there's a role for business, but it is not in setting policy. Uh, I, I've, been, I've met with people, I've been on panels with people that were directors of schools that, that called themselves education entrepreneurs. I want to I want to stand on this because you you know you can't talk about parent leadership in the urban environment unless you deal with this issue, right? Um, so I think that you know really we developed a proposal along with Annenberg and the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers called Sustainable Community Schools that. SIG money, one, that, that we don't believe that ESEA should be competitive. There shouldn't be winners and losers. So I think the reauthorization of ESEA is important. But also that those resources need to go towards stabilizing communities. So we want sustainable community schools that uh, focus on a strong focus on school culture, curriculum, and staffing, like a student-centered culture, that provide wraparound supports for every child. I just put my son in a school um, on the north side of Chicago, I, I want to go, that's a long story, but I put him in this school because the school in my neighborhood is absolutely destabilized. When I went to this school, it had 500 students, it had more teacher aides, had more uh, paraprofessionals than they had teachers. But at the neighborhood school with about the same amount of students in my, in my neighborhood, there are only four teacher aides in the entire building, right? 
equity <laughs> is an issue that we, we're not dealing with. So I think we need, we need wraparound supports that help to remove those obstacles from our young people. That's why community schools are so important because, you know, I was, I was a resource coordinator at a school called South Shore High School. We polled the entire community, asked, what did you want to see? Every young man I talked to said, we want to record the studio. So we built a recording studio. But every child that would walk in that studio had to, I'd give him a newspaper article. You're going to write your rap about this. You're going to sing your song about gentrification. You're going to do your song about the, the economic crisis. And, and because they were in this recording studio, can you imagine a 19-year-old that had dropped out of school, sitting there learning about similes, hyperboles, and metaphors? But that's how, but it was responsive to the need, to, to the desires of the people in the community. And finally, schools have to be community institutions. If we're engaged in the school, if our input is respected, then we will own the school's success and we'll own its struggles. If not, then again, you have alien institutions in your neighborhood. Um, and let me also take a shot, Anne, at your question. I think that um, when we think about investment in parent leadership, for me, it feels like you have to invest on two tracks here. Um, Oftentimes we think of leadership development for parents because we need to teach them how to do something. Um, and sure, we all benefit from learning and, and equipping ourselves with new skills. And uh, there is a huge need for that investment. Parents all the time, especially when they were appointed to school site councils, would say to me, I don't know what my job is, no one is training me, I don't know how to read this budget, I want to make a contribution, I know I have something to say, but we weren't investing in building their capacity to be amazing, knocking out, knocking out of the ballpark school site members, and that's what they wanted to be. So that, there is a deep need uh, for that investment across all levels of leadership. But I also think we need an investment of those whose attitudes we need to change about parents. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of attitude changing that we need to make because school systems and people that work inside of them, unfortunately, do not want to share power. And they especially do not want to share power with poor people and black people and brown people. And that's just the truth. And until we invest in the kind of attitude change, I don't know how else to say it, um, enlightenment, skill building, empathy, just, yes, <laughs> we need to do the disrupting, um, then I think we're, we're not going to get we're not going to yield what we need to yield in our schools. It will, be, it will continue to become a voice for some and not a voice for all. And what we know is that when parents do not have a voice, when we do not really honor who they are as, as they are the customer, we are there to serve them, then we will continue to have a system that works for those parents that is equipped, that has confidence, that uh, has a sense of entitlement. And we honor that. We honor that at school systems. And when we see parents, I remember, and maybe this is why I've carried this for 25, 30 years in my career. When I was a third grade student, my mother who did not speak English, who didn't dress very well because she didn't have money, who, uh, was, was, does, did not have the confidence to ask questions. I remember the day she came into the office, and I think I might have gotten in trouble for something, because I don't know why else she would have come. Um, I remember the people behind the counter laughing at her and ridiculing who she was because of how she looked, because she didn't speak the language, and I would love to say that I wish those days were gone. But I saw that over and over again when I was a school board member. And if we don't change those attitudes, um, 
I don't think we will see the kind of family and parent engagement that we know is crucial for our kids to succeed. Time for one last question, and we have a lucky winner. Good morning. Um, my name is Sabrina Epps. I'm the District 1 board member for Prince George's County Public Schools. And I also um, bring you greetings from higher education, which is why I ran for Prince George's County Public Schools. Um, so lots happened and you know, we have a lot of people on the board now and some are elected and some are appointed. And the reason I engage with parents every day because they email me to tell me what the system's not doing for them. And um, I, there's always a line that says something to the effect of, you know, I can't believe this is what you want from my child. So I know my heart and I know that that is absolutely not what I want for their children. I want their children to have equity and academic excellence. Um, I'm dying to have a conversation about that in the, in the year and a half that I've been serving. Um, it's just not happening. So, I've decided that um, now that the oversight, um, the check and balance between governance and the um, CEO's desire to um, run the system how he sees fit and close schools without consulting parents and put schools in schools without consulting parents and um, that I would try to advocate for parents and for children um, but I don't know how, so I'm taking a step out on a limb, and I'm being courageous, and I'm asking for help. Um, teach me how to do that, because that's not my training. And um, teach me how to make it better for the 130 or so children in Prince George's County. So, um, happy to help. <laughs> And so let's connect with, with us after this panel. And I know here at IEL, we happen to be here in Washington, D.C. We're happy to, to help with that. There are other experts in the room, like Ann Henderson and Vito, uh, and, and a, a great many folks who have some experience on the ground. Um, I think, actually, that statement is an interesting way to kind of close out, because we started, to, we started with a leadership panel, and we have somebody that's actually in you know governance and leadership who said, I need help. And the truth is that. That's the case all around the country. You know, a lot of folks find themselves in positions of leadership, and it really is almost accidental uh, unless they have a personal interest in this issue of engaging families and doing it well. Um, you can study up to the PhD level, the EDD level, and never take a course on family engagement, parent involvement, or any of that, unless that's an interest of yours. Uh, and so, and yet we can't wait for pre-service to, to get its act together. We can't, you know, we don't have the luxury of doing that. So we've got to have this combination of, of caring folks in positions of influence that push the envelope of parent leaders and advocates and community organized that force us to do a better job. Um, and we've got to work together. We've got to collaborate. I think uh, G2, I can't remember all your four things, but they certainly are germane in terms of what we all need. We certainly all need to believe. We certainly all need to collaborate. We certainly all need to work more closely together on this critical issue. So I want to give one last round of applause to our panel. And I believe we're about to take a five-minute break.